to welcome everybody back to the Independent Investor Channel. No doubt, uh, putting out the highly on content has been kind of a mainstay on the channel. I feel like it's uh, just about as relevant now as ever. Um, over the last couple of years, it's been an interesting impasse between monitoring the company's progress uh, and the stock's performance, which have been too uh, as contrasting of, uh, of, of powers that could, can possibly be identified. And um, is it justified? I don't know. I don't think any of that's really important uh, when I'm covering the Highland story. You know, for me as an investor, guys, I've been um, investing in, in the stock market uh, really actively from the time that it was legal to do so. Um, and before then, I've been fascinated by financial markets. And um, it, I'm, I'm humbled at the opportunity to come and, and share the story. Uh, I think you can value, um, receive a lot of benefit and value from my perspective and understanding that I look at Johnson & Johnson and Procter and & Gamble and Home Depot a lot different than I look at an opportunity like this. Um, and it's a pleasure. It is. Um, I think we're hitting on all of the right elements uh, of a new and emerging company. And um, my conviction has, um, has never wavered from the beginning. Um, I'm feeling a little under the weather today. There's no doubt about it. So I'm fighting through this to deliver content for you guys. So, you know, hopefully we can provide you guys a relevant update and you guys can you know, take some value uh, out of this. This is active investing, which requires uh, a significant amount more uh, covering the, the company, uh, monitoring progress. And we have different feelers out there all over the community, uh, which feed me information. And I, in turn, feed you guys with the best information that we have. Um, I'm glad to do it. Um, I, I could just as easily not do it. Um, I, you know, lots of different um, um, areas of, of, of scrutiny that I put myself under over social media. Um, I could give two shits, really. I, 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 I don't really care what you think um, my intent is on this message. Um, I, I don't typically cross compare. And, and you know, th there's been some scrutiny of me, interestingly enough. Um, and, and you don't know me. You don't know me. I think in, in the sheer reality of it, this stock is going to do one of two things here, sitting at about $4.50. We've just come off of a nice week here up 11%, showing a little bit of strength for the first time in a long time. Um, can't put my thumb on why that is. Um, definitely had our triple bounce from the technical perspective. Um, it's, it's broke above its support line and, and uh, the, the technical show that it's due for a breakout coming into next week. Um, I don't know if those are going to hold true. Um, technical investing is not one of those things that I look to assign to a company like this pre-profit. Uh, pre um, it, it has just turned out its first little dab of, um, of profit. But um, putting up any type of metrics on a company like this that's treated as volatile as it has, um, I've taken out some of the um, reaction to that volatility and I've contended that if you're gonna hold the company just to own it long, uh, take a lot of the guesswork out of it, We've got a lot of people that are speculating one way or the other. That's no problem. Um, everybody's welcome to their opinion. Um, there, there, there's certainly um, a, a little bit of bantering going back and forth within the community. Um, I'm disappointed by that because some of the sources of that bantering and, and some of the targets of criticism have been the sources of some really good information that I've been able to garner over the last couple of years. And I've been hungry for that information. Um, and I've been sincerely gracious uh, for each and every one of the content creators to come on and off of that. I don't care who you are. Um, I, I'm not one to call you one, one way or the other. Look, I don't know you either. Um, so it's somewhat hypocritical for me to come on and say, look, you don't know me, uh, but then imply that I know everybody else in the landscape. I think if I was just going to chalk it up as some level of disappointment, as far as I'm concerned, I, I think we're all hungry for information. And you know, is it going to be um, all, all well and forgiven when this thing does end up turning north, which um, I still have 100% conviction um, that this company is hitting on a lot of different areas, a lot of different spot, soft spots in an industry that needs this solution. Now, whatever happens over the next couple of years, which we've gone through two years already in financial markets with this company, been a very, very, very dismal ride as far as the stock price goes. Um, ironically, it's been great to share the highly on story because it's one that I can get behind. Um, it, it's one that I can invest in. I mean, I invest in Altria Group. Do you think for a second time behind smoking? No, 
But my application, uh, as far as drawing that line between business and making money is very, very specific. Um, do I think cigarettes are good for uh, mankind? No, I don't. <laughs> do I think that's going to stop people from smoking? No. Do, do, is that going to stop Altria Group and, and, and Philip Morris from profiting from people's um, ill-advised health decisions with their own personal health and well-being? Probably not. I know. And I think a lot of you guys really make this out to be more than it is. And it, it is just stock market investing. Uh, this so happens to be some speculative investing. I talked about this on the live stream. It was nice enough to have Jason come on and give us some more insights from his trip down uh, to Hylion. Um, the nuggets that I took back on, on this was really during the ride along um, and during the um, explanation where Thomas and Jason were standing outside the hyper truck and there was a little bit of Q&A going back and forth. I thought the interview was, uh, was good. I, I, you know, um, it, it is, it is what it was. And, and, um, you know, good, good on Jason for going down there and, and sharing that information with the greater community. I thought the multiple products that were rolled out um, to kind of summarize what happened and what I gathered to be uh, just, just a little over a half a day uh, because of Thomas's schedule, et cetera, going through meetings, that type of thing. So, you know, uh, holistically, it's a little bit selfish, I think, uh, for people to come on and just, just spite that, that information. And I, I, I don't really understand people's lack of appreciation. I don't, I don't get it. Uh, I, I um, am probably uh, expecting too much of social media, um, which will continue to be um, the armpit of humanity going forward. But um, for me on the Independent Investor Channel, it's an opportunity to come and, and share my insights and, and the potential to, to, to share in this opportunity together, uh, I think is second to none. Uh, I know there's a ton of good people in this community and, you know, the higher the conviction, it seems like the more scrutiny. I, I think, you know, Rick's done a pretty good job of really being steadfast on his mission going through. But I, I think the real Christopher um, got, got rushed right out of the Yahoo thread. And uh, I, the real Christopher's fabulous information that uh, is, is put through on the discord. He's not getting paid for that information. You know, uh, I, I think it's wonderful. I've personally benefited from that information and I hope what little give back I've been able to provide uh, to the community as well um, has in turn helped others uh, make that much more of an informed decision. Does making an informed decision mean that you're absolutely going to render success in this stock or any other? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You can have an opportunity just completely licked and, and it can kick you right in the teeth. Um, that's investing. And I just think seemingly a lot of these folks that are doing a lot more complaining um, than productive dialogue, I question sometimes really whether or not they've actually um, been an investor in the markets because um, so sometimes the attitudes and the, the, the opinions and the overreach um, sometimes surprise me. And I, I, I wonder, you know, um, and, and these are sometimes people with a few hundred shares the position and, and not, to, not, not to pick fun at, the, at those folks, but you know, when your level of, of conviction on a company that you're supposed to be convicted on is a few hundred bucks or a few hundred shares, um, I think you kind of need to check yourself a little bit when you've got some guys like myself and, and others with significantly larger positions in this company uh, that, um, that, that are steadfast on this. And how can two opinions differ so much? Um, is one warranted more than the other because I hold a higher share base? Of course not. But keep it in perspective. I, th I think sometimes some of these folks that are yelling the loudest um, are some of the folks that really are yelling from a position of non-strength with regard to the position that they hold in this company, and they're yelling to hear themselves yell. I really think that. What to expect in 2020? I expect over the next two years, it's going to be a countdown for me. Uh, I'm going to continually and uh, aggressively track progress. Uh, throughout 22, 2022 and into 2023, I don't really look at the year's ending of 2022 and 2023 uh, exclusively. I actually look at them together. I, I think we're in a bridging phase of the company where we're moving out of 2022, entering into what uh, Hylion has deemed to be one of the most important stages, and that's winter validation. Uh, the um, uh, fleet units will be turned out to the fleets sometimes from now until mass scale up and deployment uh, into uh, Q4 of 2022. I think that's going to be a great segue into the potential for seeing some of the metrics turned back by some of the fleets 
when they get their hands on some of these uh, demo models, which will not be the one that Jason drove. Um, these are going to be the fine-tuned model to put your best foot forward uh, when these companies take ownership of these uh, units, probably one, to be introduced into the rigor of their own unique uh, applications. Uh, I think that's going to be fabulous to watch. I'm just really like a kid in a candy store. I'm fascinated by them uh, entering into this um, uh, this evolution uh, into latter 2023 when we start the ramp up and scale up. I'm going to talk about that a little bit, uh, what that could mean. I look at this as a countdown. I look at this as a bridge year. Um, you can look at uh, the Hylian story in route to a potential market cap of, you know, something more respectable once they become an established company. And I, I'm looking at 16 billion uh, as an established company once they start to realize their relationship, solidify it with Peterbilt, and that in turn provides um, some of that domino effect within the industry uh, when those units are being sold to customers and that, that bottom line validation is being met, those other uh, OEMs are going to jump on board as well uh, or, or be forced to just lose out on that revenue and stand by on the sideline and watch Peter Bill uh, uh, take, take the cake there and really look to separate themselves. Um, I, I think the winter validation is key. And once that winter validation is done, it's going to be incumbent upon Hylian to gain the three levels of certification through the EPA, the CARB, and MIPSA. That's going to be huge for the company. Uh, again, I have no reason to suggest, excuse me, that they're going to not meet those certifications. And I think that's going to be huge. I think for companies that are reluctant to buy the Hypertruck ERX now, I think that's only going to be that further validation going through that certification as more exploratory technology and making sure that it can meet the rigors of the standard by which it is being judged against. I think that's going to be a huge, huge deal. I saw Nikola take a, a step up when they were able to reach uh, and meet their certification. I think it's going to be a huge, huge tailwind for Hylion. Um, it's going to be one of those solidifications for me as a shareholder. Um, they'll get a fist bump from me, no doubt about it, when they reach this certification milestone sometime in um, the uh, latter uh, Q4 of 2022 and going into uh, Q1 of uh, 2023. As a matter of fact, probably just Q4 of 2022, okay, where we'll look to see some of that winter validation. Over 2022, I would charge the community with continuing to look at the hybrid EX sales. I go back to Q4 and the remarks that were made by Sherry Baker during the Q4 call, calling for two to three million in revenue those revenues are going to be generated by the hybrid EX product. Um, I heard this and I had to rewind it and listen to it again. Um, you know, interesting enough for me, a, a product that's not getting a lot of scuttlebutt in the industry by Thomas Healy's admission because of Fleet's hesitancy to go to hybrid and more showing an interest in the full electrification type of, of, of uh, approach um, and, and, and understanding that some of the learnings that have gone on from the hybrid would imply that those learnings have been incorporated into the Hypertruck ERX. With all of that said, what an amazing milestone if this company can turn out two to $3 million of revenue in 2022, only going to help bridge the gap between um, this year, 2022 and 2023, going into mass scale up when the Hypertruck ERX is gonna be that much more ready for mass scale uh, and ramp up of that product. So I, I, I couldn't believe it when she said it. Uh, I have no reason to dispute that. They must have enough interest to project such a huge increase uh, in those sales numbers. I mean, that is a huge, huge increase where 200,000 has been garnered, garnered as per the last Q4 call. And to project that 2022 is going to contain two to three million in revenue, I thought was an enormous, enormous win for the company. All right. So that's going to be key for me is to monitor the hybrid EX sales uh, in 2022, the winter validation. 
I was shared some statistics and I want to correct some of my um, assumptions on the last video when I was talking about numbers and the Hypertruck ERX, Rick Schnellman uh, was kind enough to provide this to me, not once, but twice. And I saw it the first time, Rick, and thanks for that. I really appreciate it. But he wanted to make sure that I saw those numbers um, and they're, they're very telling in understanding what that minimum threshold is for Hylion to meet. Rick was projecting about 4,500 on the low end and he rounded it up to about 5,000. And I, I realized why he did it with about $30,000 of profit per unit, okay? To hit that $150 million of top end revenue, okay? Um, that was going to uh, garner that break even impasse between the, the cost of operations and the number of units that were going to be sold to offset that cost of operations. Now, with that said, I, I, I found that to be fascinating. And I initially, when he told me the number, I, I thought, man alive, what, what the hell, hell am I doing in this company? Um, because it, it kind of scared me a little bit. Um, and here's why. 5,000 units per year seemed rather lofty uh, until you start to break down the numbers and you really start to understand what Hylion could be actually capable of doing with the assistance of their existing OEM. Double down during the JMAC interview with Thomas Healy, where he talked about the importance of the relationship with Peterbilt. I think it would be lesser of an OEM and, and no offense to, Ken, uh, to, uh, to Kenworth, I believe, uh, and, and some of the others. Uh, but but Peterbilt is, is the all-star. I mean, they are the industry standard. Um, and no offense to Volvo Penta and, and, and no offense to any of the other ones, you know, Mac and, and, and uh, International and some of the other OEMs out there. Uh, but, but Peterbilt really is kind of the, the, the balance in this whole thing. And here's what uh, Rick was able to share with me. And it really brought this statistic home for me. Peterbilt turns out 40,000 units per year, 40,000 units per year. This is incredible. And so I'm, I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, if Hylion needs 5,000 units, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, three, 400 units per month to make that a reality. Is that feasible if a number of fleets want these and they're taking these build slots to where they're securing any number of these few hundred slots, few slots, you know, which is what was declared on the Q4 call all the way up to the 400, which is about that max break even point that I talked about. The question for you guys as an investor community is, is that feasible? Um, some of you guys might just want to throw tomatoes at me and say, Ryan, you're, you're really off. It's not possible. And I bring you back to the facts. You're entitled to your opinions, but the facts are that Peterbilt has that volume capacity to turn that many units out. Now, I'm not implying that Hylion right away is going to secure two to 400 build slots every single month. I'm not saying that. Could they? Hell yeah. Why not? If, if the companies that Peterbilt represents in way of the fleets put the ample pressure on to say, we want the Hylion solution on our rig when it's turned off of the line, why would they decline to do that? It's just a good business sense to do that. Why would Peterbilt be called upon with Hylion in such the early stages of the game if they didn't believe in the product? And I'll tell you what, I don't want to speak for you guys, but I became more of a believer in the product watching JMAC investing, right? Jason was down there driving the Hypertruck ERX. And there were some real takeaways for me that solidified what I already presumed to know. Now I knew this was a friend of mine in the truck actually driving it commenting and I liked how Jason was kind of commenting a little bit. He got a little bit of crap for it because he's not a truck driver. No, he's not a truck driver. It's okay. It's okay. It's great because you get an impartial opinion. Now I'm sure a lot of truck drivers that you know a lot of people don't like change. Okay. And when you've got a young innovating company like this, that you know, you're gonna have those truck drivers that have been driving for 30 or 40 years say it's too quiet. It's, I, this is crazy. Now, I, what, what'd you say? I can't hear because I've been having a diesel engine blowing in my ear for the entire life of my driving career. And this just is abnormal to me. But I think for the younger generation looking to step into 
this highly on opportunity and maybe start to backfill some of the driver shortage in the industry, I think they're going to be much more excited to get behind the wheel of this new and emerging technology than they will the old existing technology. And I, I mentioned a couple of different reasons as to why that is. Yes, comfort of drive is huge. This is something that has just arisen. I've talked about it throughout the course of the channel and people who follow me know that I have. It just made sense to me and it was nice to hear the agility rep double, double down uh, on that being a very selling feature within uh, their own specific fleets on bringing new talent on board to actually put them behind the wheel and just have much more of a comfortable experience. Now, the other element to that is, do you think these young drivers are really that interested in supporting big oil? And you might think, Ryan, that's a little bit of a stretch. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I kind of beg to differ, man. This young com uh, community of folks that we've got coming up in their late teens, early 20s, like my, like my daughter, she's tough. OK, she believes what she believes. And I don't think she's any different than any other younger generation that have a little bit of stewardship for those beliefs that they have. Environmental stewardship being one of them. And the last thing they want to do is be called upon in an industry that they consider to be a polluter, a net polluter of the industry. Now, industry would, would admit to this. I, this isn't a pop shot to the, to the fleets out there. They know that something has to change. They know it. And the very, very solution that's out there is the highly on solution. And if they're going to bring some of this talent alongside and say, look, the more you drive this thing, the better off for the environment it is, how, how great is that going to be to attract new talent? And this isn't my opinion. This was backed up by the agility rep that was down there. And I'd like to see that doubled down on much, much more uh, by the uh, Innovation Council fleets and the representatives that exist, both the Innovation Council and, and other fleets on, on using the um, <coughs> hyper truck opportunity to, to attract new talent in the industry. All right. We're going to continue to monitor in 2022 the job solicitation and filling. Um, this has been a, a, a real bright spot. I give highly on an A plus in this category. Um, they've done nothing but impress me. There's no doubt about it. They've built out the team from top to bottom. They value their employees. People seem to be happy with working there for the most part. I think it's a great thing. The management and the board, the executive uh, management, fantastic. So they've done a wonderful job in solidifying this team. Now, these are investments that I presume are going to pay off down the line. Um, right now, if you expect that Elaine Chow's ex uh, existence or presence on the board or Mr. Knight, his presence on the board or Dan Gallagher, or any of these others are going to pay dividends now, I think that could be a little bit premature of an application, but I absolutely expect that at some point down the line, the unforeseen catalyst that I think is super powerful with this company because they are on the front wave of innovation. Jason says that they're an, inno an, an innovator and a disruptive technology company. I, I, I don't know. I think, I think it's a little different than that insofar as the industry has been waiting a long time for a, for a disruptor to come along and actually provide a product that they can actually look at the bottom line and justify making that leap of faith with them. Whereas full electric and, and, and the BEV application, the, the full BEV vehicles, um, they, they fail in performance. Uh, and you can argue with me all you want. But Tesla does not stack up in the class eight space, not from what I've seen. Um, I, I think Nikola is probably right there. And I think Hyzon is right there. But outside of those three in the class eight space, I don't think there's a competitor that can match what these three bring to the table when sitting down across the table and going through the uh, total TCO Total cost of ownership to the bottom line, good for the environment, good for the business, and good for payload, all three. <coughs> now, there's some intangibles that go along with that cell. I think the Hypertruck ERX, to be honest with you guys, is a slam dunk. Um, I, I think it's easy to sit across from the table and sell this thing. Um, is this my opinion? Sure. I'll play ball. 
but have they done nothing but prove that they can sell this to fleets in way of order reservations? These suckers are starting to add up, okay? And I think the scrutiny would be warranted if you could come on to the Independent Investor Channel and say they have no sales, which I've heard before. I've heard they have no sales. Um, they have over 2,000 Hypertruck ERX orders on the books. And you could say, well, uh, some of those are non-binding orders. Oh, okay. If you're suggesting perhaps that agility is just going to pull chocks and not uh, be loyal to a company that they've been loyal to since day one, um, then that's your thesis. Um, I take the contrary argument. I think agility is going to show up in a big way. I think Pinsky is going to show up in a good way, a big way. I think some of these original gangsters that these guys have got on their team from the beginning, I think they're going to show up in a big way. And I think they're with Hylion for the long haul. I do. I think Pinsky is a rental outlet um, in, in, in some of the, some of the smaller classes uh, space. Uh, I, I think Hylion has an unexploited market there that's um, going to be really, really excited to, um, to monitor to see how things unfold over the long term. I really do. So it's going to be fascinating to, to watch this story in 2022 unfold. Uh, I, I would encourage you guys to look at this again uh, from the lens of a percentage toward an end. Um, I've always contended that I have been a long shareholder. Um, I, I thought that the first look would come at five plus years, uh, and that's looking to hold. If, if we're able to look at this thing four years plus, it'll be a luxury as far as I'm concerned as a bullish shareholder. But after five years, we should have a pretty good idea uh, of what we're looking at marching toward uh, a more electrified uh, future uh, using um, the, the fuel sources that help us diversify away from uh, a diesel dominated uh, type of environment and fleets want to do it, right? So when they're looking at that bottom end um, uh, uh, benefit, you know, it's been easy up to this point to, to decline and say, thank you so much. We really want to change the environment, but you have to bring something that is, is pal palatable for us. You, you can't just show up and say that we're supposed to just change uh, our fleet application um, and spend an enormous amount of time plugged into the grid, charging a battery only to get you know 250 to 350 miles out of that. You, you can't expect us to uh, look to incorporate that and justify that to the bottom line. Okay, and that's why I don't understand the move from Pepsi. It'll be nice to see uh, them substantiate that move from Tesla. If Tesla can even uh, come through on that order and delivery, remember these are all OEMs in and of themselves. Uh, whereas Hylion is not. Hylion is is has already partnered um, with one of the absolute most fabulous Peterbilt. And you, you say, well, what if Peterbilt pulls out and they're not? They're not in line with with uh, Hylion. Well, those will be the things through active investing that I look at um, as one of those catalysts to the downside. Okay, and I will reevaluate. But here's the thing: Hylion does a really, really good job of, of of putting out a lot of really, really good information, a lot of frequently good information uh, to keep me engaged in, in the game enough to where my conviction remains at a super, super high level. Okay, and until that changes. I will continue to come on and, and foot stomp the opportunity for you guys uh, and share my thesis week over week as we look to evolve with this. But I look at it like this, four and a half percent to my goal. Uh, I've got a first look-see as far as the stock price at 100 a share. Um, it's just that simple. Um, I know a lot of you guys, and it might be entertaining for you guys to get a little piece of my insight because um, I don't think like you do. I can guarantee you don't think like me. I guarantee it. All right. But here's here's the funny thing. One of two things are going to happen. Eh, one of three. Let me be fair. Stock goes to zero, goes out of business, and then I can stop making highly on videos all 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 together and just continue on with my life doing what it is that I do, do a little side hustle project through the independent investor, helping people invest, et cetera, et cetera. That's course of action number one. Course of action number two is this thing for the next 10 years just goes on a, a plane and it ends up you know, making 10, 12, 15 bucks, maybe 20 bucks tops, that never to be really integrated uh, from a mass scale by the, the fleets. Um, that's a course of action number two. Um, course of action number three is that 
a lot of the um, uh, positive attributes that I put on this company with regard to it being um, the solution uh, in, in the industry. Uh, will this get them uh, 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 the ability to reduce their carbon footprint on, on the environment? The answer is yes, it will. Um, will, it, will it allow them to potentially carry more cargo in their fleet? Yes, it will. Um, will it remain uh, uh, on par or even a little bit better in way of the range that they can get out of this hyper truck ERX for a solution going forward? You bet it can, a thousand plus on, on the, the range for the ERX. And then finally, some of the other intangibles, right? Driver experience um, and, and making that shift to more of a green future, which is inevitable. And I just have a really, really hard time when I sit back and say, Ryan, are you, are you over on this? Are you over your skis? I sit back and I look at this and I say, if, if Hylion cannot, if Hylion cannot um, benefit from this movement going forward to a cleaner future, then it will be on Hylion for not, uh, not grasping the opportunity correctly. Things happen in business. I, I totally get it. Um, maybe Peterbilt moves in a different direction. I think that would be a drastic, drastic shot for Hylion because they rely on that relationship with the OEM uh, specifically, okay? Um, if Cummins came in and acquired Hylion, well, then it would be over. We would own shares in Cummins now and we would be, benef we would be benefiting uh, secondarily from the Hypertruck ERX sales under the Cummins flag. Do I think that's gonna happen? No, I don't. I don't suspect that that will happen. Um, I didn't suspect from the beginning that Cummins would ever be a threat. To be honest with you, they became a little bit more of a threat when they acquired Meritor, I believe. But I honestly believe strategically from the perspective of Cummins, this really does allow them the opportunity to uh, get a, a, a secondary exposure to the EV market and allow Hylion to just carry the flag of, of, of exclusive EV and run the onboard analytics and all that. I never thought that Cummins would want to pursue so far away from what their strength is, and that's that they are an engine manufacturer first, uh, and then potentially looking at a, a real paradigm shift in the industry, moving from a predominantly diesel-dominated uh, uh, past into what I consider to be uh, a much more of, of a CNG uh, type of agnostic future. So I think it's a way for Cummins to really set up their opportunity um, to get some indirect exposure to EV um, through the opportunity that, uh, uh, that was made possible by acquiring Meritor, all right? Um, what does it mean for this Hylion opportunity? I, I think if you sit back and, and you think about what Hylion's trying to do, they're trying to, they're trying to rethink the engineering here. The idea of putting uh, a generator on board as opposed to um, the internal combustion engine that drives a drive shaft, that drives the, uh, the rear axle. You know, to me, I look at it and I, I think, man alive, you know, why didn't somebody think about this before? Uh, I think it's brilliant, and I think it's coming from the mind of a brilliant uh, engineer. I do. I, I think Thomas Healy looked at this, and I, I think, um, you know, and Hylion is really the brainchild of Thomas Healy. Let's be real and give full credit where credit is due. Uh, but I think he looked at this and said, you know what, um, with my mechanical aptitude, I think we can do this in a better way. Um, I, I think we can, um, we can build a truck to provide the trifecta and the trifecta being power, payload, and env uh, environmental stewardship uh, on behalf of, of Hylion. And he had enough environment, uh, mechanical savvy to say, look, um, this can happen. Now, there was a few uh, interesting snafus through the history of Hylion looking to put it on the trailer. Uh, instead of the tractor itself. Uh, I find that interesting, you know, and, and uh, just a, 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 a real testament to Thomas Healy's perseverance and, and making this company a reality um, and, and seeing this dream come to fruition. Um, the Hypertruck ERX right now, the iteration alpha is not the final version, but it's pretty close. And I, I don't want to be presumptuous and say, you know, Thomas Healy must be pretty proud of this. Um, you know, Thomas, uh, Thomas Healy um, demonstrated, and Jason spoke on this, his sheer conviction and commitment to this mission. Uh, and that's, that's a real interest to me. Uh, I, I give 
I give Thomas Healy a, a little bit of latitude and understanding that the guy has been a CEO for all of what, two years? Um, I'd love to see Thomas Healy five years from now. Um, I'd love to see where he takes this. Um, what does this company mean for Thomas Healy when he's got the backing of all major final, financial institutions and they're able to produce this product with very, very little overhead, which it's a lean business model, guys, if you haven't woken up to that fact. Um, and th they're able to make a, a dent in some capacity, one to 2% is, of course, where the bulls have that sweet spot, which is about 15,000 units, as opposed to the 5,000 that Rick has um, so graciously shared with the group there as far as that break even type of um, type of number that we hit to make uh, cost and, and make things kind of make sense to keep the lights on at highly on and know that there's going to be some reoccurring orders and that that order book can grow uh, as the demand grows and that we can uh, meet that demand and growth uh, by potentially bringing on other OEMs and fleets that are represented by those other OEMs, uh, Freightliner, uh, International, Volvo, Penta, Cummins, all, all of them, right? Uh, so very, very important, Mac uh, and, and, and the like. Um, but I, I think it's super important to kind of keep this thing in context. And I think patience is going to be the key uh, in, in looking at this over the next two years. If the stock is at 450 at the end of this year, um, no problem. Um, I will consider that a win because I do consider 2022 to be a bridge year. But I think the best point in the discussion, this is why we have these discussions. You know, some people go at each other's throats and you know, you're wrong and I'm right. And I, I've fallen victim to it over the last couple of years. And I'd like to think I'm a better person now than I was then uh, for evolving to a better place to understand and try to be as open to other opinions as I possibly can. But Jason, uh, with JMAC investing, he, he, he hit it on the head um, and he really put it out there right in front of my face during a live stream. And he, he said, he said, Ryan, answer me this. Do you, do you think that as they approach that 5,000, that the stock price is going to remain at $4.50? The answer without him even finishing was absolutely not. Um, there's no way in hell that this company can be ignored for very long. And if you look at this at 450 or 350 or 750, there's really not a whole lot of difference in my mind because the true value of this company is going to be realized when it falls along the spectrum that we're starting to define for themselves. I'm not offering that 5,000 as, as a, a goal or, or a benchmark that has to be met um, at any time in the short to medium term. I think eventually it needs to be met, okay? But, but the question is, where in the eyes of the stock market are they going to assign true value? Okay, anybody can look at this and say, well, the, the market has got highly on wrong all the way up to this point. They've severely and drastically overpriced the stock. I agree. And they've severely underpriced the stock as well with it se severely selling off to almost, almost liquidation value, let's be real. And I think in either of those extreme circumstances, uh, the truth or the true value probably lies somewhere in between because we don't know what the potential of this company is. And the potential, if it falls on that um, spectrum where they start to fill out these uh, order slots and they start to look at this realistically and they're starting to piece together a few hundred, let's say they piece together 50 or 60, 70 per month. Well, th that's 25% toward that low end goal of 200 units per month right? If they start to piece together a hundred, now we're talking about 25% toward the high end of that goal of 400 units per month. You see how this can start to materialize as we start to define this spectrum of possibility. And you think, okay, well, that's all presumptuous on your part, Ryan. You're just making stuff up here. Am I? There's 200 real orders, not orders, a mix between orders and reservation on the books right now. The question is, where are we going to be in two years from now? This has been done over the last two years with supply chain shortages, a global pandemic, and now a, a global uh, unrest, okay? Surging diesel prices, which should be a headwind for Hylion.
no doubt. Um, I'll bet they're sitting back saying, man, I wish we had a product right now. We'd be saving fleets a ton of money on the bottom line if we could just get these uh, uh, products in the hands of the fleets. And I actually do believe, I mean, if, if you're looking at the very intent of the hybrid EX product, we should be on the high end of that revenue through a high diesel phase here with the company. So we're looking at, you know, $3 million. What if they're able to go four or 5 million? Is that not a catalyst for the stock? So I think we're at a real impasse here. And it's just fascinating to me to identify a stock that has been completely beat down with the rest of the sector. It's not being exclusively beaten down. It's be being holistically beaten down within an EV sector that has just been annihilated, right? There's just no doubt about it. And so when we look at the prospects going forward on what we could look to fill out on the order book here, I only offer those injects to you to see what is necessary and what the OEM has been possible uh, to, to turn out. And thanks to Rick for that information. And also thanks to Jason for pointing out that, you know, the, the real catalyst and the real breakpoint and the impasse in the stock price between what the stock is doing and the company is doing is going to, going to, going to, going to reach that equilibrium. And then it's going to shift. It's going to shift where people look at this and the education isn't going to be something that I need to come on and share every week. It's going to be something that's right there in your face. Analysts are not going to have any type of excuse or out anymore to pick the low end of the um, target price to put this company against. Right now, they have all the rationale they need, right? Um, do I think it's justified? No, I don't. Um, I, I really don't. I, I think it, it, it takes a lot more imagination to come out with an initial price target of mine of $24 on the onset, because I believe at some point into the future, those numbers are going to start to come to fruition. And that war chest of capital is only going to be fortified with each and every sale that they get. And that's only going to extend the amount of time that's going to be necessary to really start the churn on that mass order and scale as we get close to the first impasse at the end of uh, 2024, uh, end of 2023, as we start that mass scale up. And that's where I think the real fun is going to start with this company. I think over the next 24 months, I think we have a bridging period. I, I, I think stepping into that future is really going to put our mark on that spectrum of potential sales, right? 15,000 is on the high end. Um, I don't share, shy away from scary numbers, guys. 15,000 on the high end. Could they do more globally? Absolutely. Sky's the limit when we talk global exposure. But when we're talking 15,000 units, I, I've got my $16 billion company and I'm also a millionaire at that time. So, it, you know, the reason why I'm so adamant about coming on and sharing this, even though my nose is dripping like Niagara Falls right now, is because I'm passionate for what this opportunity could mean. While a lot of people are quick to accuse or criticize or, or, or say other things very presumptuously that I'm trying to pump the stock, I don't believe that's possible. I don't. I, I believe that there's a new way of advertising on social media, and that's quite simply to provide awareness. You can invest or not. Um, I personally could care less. Um, if, if you're an asshole, I don't want you to invest in this because to be honest with you, man, uh, there's going to be people out here that are bad investors that hear my message and they respect my opinion. And lo and behold, they're going to buy this position and they're going to make money. Bad investors, they're going to make money. Good investors, they're going to justify selling out or never taking a position in this company. No problem. I totally understand. Each and every decision that you have to make, you have to make on your own. I only provide this to continue to provide what I feel like is a fascinating story. And as we evolve through the next 24 months of bridging into something that I feel is going to be very, very special when we've got the headwind, the, excuse me, the tailwind of a, of a fleet industry that wants to move in this direction, a board of directors that's solidified and ready to rock. Um, government contracts that are there on the horizon, there for the taking, um, ZEV credits that are out there and waiting uh, for the uh, certification to come through and fleets will get to enjoy the benefits of those credits, incentive credits through the TERP program at the state and local levels, right? All these things are on the horizon. The question is, where is Hylion going to fit in on that 
uh, spectrum that we hypothesize around now in this bridging session that we're going to enter into over the next 24 months. Guys, I appreciate you tuning into the message. If you like the content coming through, man, hit the subscribe button. I appreciate the support of the channel as usual. Just a regular guy, blue collar salary coming on, sharing a story of investing with you guys. This is just where my conviction lies at the current juncture. I may change next year. We may continue to share other stories. The investing opportunity out there is infinite and it is vast. There's no doubt. There's an infinite of way, about ways of making money in the stock market. Um, I'm making my money in other capacities. I just come on and I share this very exclusive perspective on highly on holdings for your benefit as well as mine. Guys, thank you so much for tuning into the message and good luck in your investment future. Yeah.